Hi, everyone. Welcome to The View. We are so excited today to bring you Marisol Caballero, from, um, who wears many hats. And I'm going to have Mari introduce herself in just a few moments. But before we do that, I'm going to give the um, hosts a chance to introduce themselves. I'm coming to you from Charlottesville, Virginia, where um, we are having torrential rain, flooding, uh, flash flood warnings. We had some uh, swift water rescue boats <laughs> going on. It's a, it's a little bit of a, of a lot going on. So I, as I just warned my co-host, if uh, our power goes out and we lose me, um, you've got plenty of other co-hosts that'll be uh, that'll be with you today. And I'm Christina Rivera. Uh, Meg. Well, it's very dull here by comparison in Minneapolis. Meg Riley. We are finally through that horrible heat wave that was 100 degrees. It rained a lot. My basement flooded. Uh, I guess life in the Midwest goes on. I had to throw away some of my 21-year-old's baby stuff that got moldy. That was really sad. That's my big sad news. What a hard life I have. Aisha, what's up? I'm Aisha Hauser and I'm in Seattle. Um, yeah, we, I haven't seen torrential rain since I've lived in Seattle. We have had hail. Uh, and today is a boring weather day, um, as Jessica can attest to, who's just across the sound. Hi, Jessica. Um, and that's me. Otherwise, uh, just, you know, the end of the year, it feels like everyone has senioritis, no matter how old they are. So that's been fun at church. <laughs> so that's me. Michael. Good morning, everyone. This is Michael Tino joining you from Peekskill, New York, where it is a beautiful spring day. Uh, a little too much pollen in the air for the sake of my itchy eyes, but other than that, life is good. I am here looking at my phone, expecting a phone call from my daughter's preschool where the social worker wants to talk to me. So if I if I disappear for a few minutes, uh, you all you all will know why it is nothing that any of you said. Um, so it's good to see you. And, and Jessica Star Rockers is is out there in Seattle. Uh, staffing our, our tech needs. Yes, I'm on um, the Facebook comments. I'm on Twitter and I'm um, going to pass anything along to the hosts and our wonderful guest to if you have any questions for them or comments or anything. Um, yeah, happy to be here. And Jessica, what is the hashtag that, that can be used? I would say hashtag that. the view, T-H-E-V-U-U. -U. Great, thank you. Um, so Mari is here, and I'm, Mari, I'm going to have yourself have yourself have you <laughs> introduce yourself and um, sure. tell us about the couple of different hats that you wear. Because I know one of my uh, favorite one is, of course, state development, uh, follows <laughs> neck and neck with the uh, with the drum. So go for it. Yes, yeah. So I have a halftime position with the UUA um, in the Faith Development Office as a Faith Innovation Specialist, which is a brand new gig. Yeah, it's very, uh, it's fun. It's exciting. Um, it, it's innovative. <laughs> and, uh, and then with DRUM, um, which of course stands for, and it's 15 or so letters long because we love acronyms um, and the longer the better apparently. Um, <laughs> it's diverse and revolutionary Unitarian Universalist multicultural ministries to use two M's in drum. Um, that is our UU People of Color organization, um, 20 plus years in existence. And my title in drum leadership on the steering committee is coordinator of the Global Majorities Collective, which you'll hear a lot more about in this episode. So I'm excited to talk about the Global Majorities Collective, but before we get in there, because the position, um, the Faith and Vision Specialist position is new uh, with the Faith Development Office, I thought it would be just wonderful if um, our audience could just hear a little bit about how that came into being, what it is, how it's developing, all that kind of stuff. Cool. Yeah. So my understanding is that the year before I came on, which I've just completed my first year as of May 1st, um, the year before there was a um, an innovation roundtable that Jessica York, my lovely supervisor, called um, of 
invite only just a few movers and shakers who are doing religious education in new ways. She wanted to gather some folks at the same table in person um, in Boston and, and um, go ahead and, and let these ideas exchange, let people meet one another who are doing new innovative things, the way we do church, the way we do religious education um, and the broad meaning of religious education, which for me, I'm, I identify as a minister and a religious educator, which I really, really hope my, my big soapbox dream for us ministers is that we understand that we're all religious educators, we're all teachers as well as ministers, and that religious educators are also uh, ministers of a type. Um, so um, she got folks together and they exchanged ideas and it was a great meeting. And then um, other folks at the UUA got wind of this and um, she got inspired herself, Jessica York did. And so there was monies shifted and folks excited about innovation. And she realized that she could have a halftime position dedicated solely to helping such new ideas uh, become reality and um, help to, to contribute. She wanted an ideas person who um, thinks really wildly and can be pulled back when necessary. And that's definitely me. Uh, so, um, so yeah, um, I, I come up with ideas. I help ideas become reality. I connect people and resources. I curate resources. Um, it's kind of all being shaped. The, um, the title is super vague, which I love because I get to, to shape it. Um, the job description was also super vague. Um, so it's, it, it's, all, it's all being shaped as, as, as I do. I, does that answer? <laughs> that sounds wonderful. It's really, really exciting. Are you working with the FOS Collaborative and the, all of the innovation that's been coming out of there? Not so far. Um, I only have 21 hours a week, but um, I do. Um, I, I do intend to. And Mark Hicks and I have talked <laughs> several times about we need to have that meeting we <laughs> keep talking about. So this is a good reminder that I need to hit him up again. And both of us, you know, we don't have much going on in our lives at all. So, um, but yeah, that's something that I. I hope to um, to do, and I really have been working hard to to connect um, entities that um, to the UUA, which have been kind of siloed in the past. You know um, that I've I've really worked hard to bridge uh, Lareda and the Faith Development Office. Um, I'm working hard to bridge Drum and the Faith Development Office. I hope to work more with um, with Blue Black Lives UU. Um, I've talked to Lena about that a bit, um, about that desire, and ho I hope we can build all kinds of bridges with um, with UUMA, with with women's. You know, I mean, yeah, women's. Um, there were like all the um, just all the groups, ministers association. Um, the more the merrier. The more connections, the better. Um, so. Yeah, um, um, I, yeah. <laughs> so one quick question, and yes, Aisha, I definitely want you to talk about the project you all are working on. Um, so if people, so if religious educators, ministers, religious professionals have innovative ideas about doing uh, religious education, can they contact you for like tips on how to get that off the ground or what to do with it, or would that be the thing to do? Precisely. That's literally the reason I exist at the UUA right now. So um, I, I welcome um, emails. Um, hit me up on Facebook if you see me there. Just um, contact me in any way possible. My UU email address is, um, of course, my first initial M and my last name, Caballero at uua.org and caballero is spelled c-a-b-a-l-l-e-r-o so um 
yeah, let me know what you want to do. And if I can't directly work with you, I will definitely put you in touch with people who can help make your dream happen and or resources. So I am, uh, I attended the round table last year, uh, a year, sorry, here are my animals, my dogs just ran in. Um, and from that, I, one of the things that I'm super passionate about is the, how we do leadership in our congregations. And so I sent in a proposal to Mari um, with the Reverend Deanna Vandiver on shared leadership. Uh, and, and the concept is, it's a few things. I did start, start out thinking it would be a training um, and hopefully it will be, but we're actually going, the proposal that we sent to Mari is a book. So, uh, and then we're going to, um, ask folks who have uh, done the model of shared leadership to write about their experience. And so uh, it, it's been a really great process. Mari and I have been working since last year on it um, and kind of going back and forth. And so it's it's been pretty cool. What do you think of it, Mari? I'm super excited about it. And I know that um, Aisha and Deanna were um, inspired by the books also Soul and Spirit um, and uh, Juana Bordas um, is going to be um, at General Assembly, I know. Um, so she's the author of the book. Um, so that's all really exciting. I know a lot of people are um, are on fire about the idea of collaborative shared ministry. Um, and honestly, that should be how we're working anyway. That, that really should be how we're working. And which is why I love that I have a foot in I'm a member of both UUMA and Lareda. I have a foot in both communities. I think that it's really important um, for ministers to work very closely with all of the religious professionals and the um, lay leadership that rises up from the congregations. Um, so yeah, I'm really passionate about that. I know that um, there's gonna be an interactive component to the, the book as well. Maybe Aisha can say a little bit more about that, but um, but it's a it's an exciting project. It's going to bring in some voices and stories from our movement that don't often get shared or lifted up as the example of the way we should be thinking about doing things. It's very countercultural, and when we think of the dominant culture as very um, Eurocentric, <laughs> so um, to do things collaboratively is. Um, is, is turning that on its head. Um, so I'm, I'm excited about that. Mari, how has your experience been um, in the, you're in the Faith Development Office, which is part of the Ministries and Faith Development, which now has co-directors, both Sarah Lemmert and Jessica York. H has there been discussion about shared leadership even within that, in the Ministries and Faith Development Office that you know of? Can you say more about like, what you're like like within our department or just within your department because i mean it ha it has to start somewhere right so and, and yeah. i think i can and the and the the ordained revs on the on this can correct me <laughs> but my experience has been that the most resistant group of people to any kind of shared leadership and or ministry has been the folks who have been given the formal authority by our system which are the ordained ministers right so um to me, because our system right now isn't, hasn't um, said formally, this has to, there's no incentive to make it different. So it's really up to the individual person yeah. to say, I want to be. So I, I guess just in general, has there been um, a discussion about what it would look like? I don't know. Am I making sense? Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, you are. Um, thank you for further um, elaborating on that. Um, so I, while there might not feel like a personal incentive to ordained folk to collaborate more and um, kind of shift their way of thinking of how we do ministry in our movement, um, I, I think that there is a, a, a broader incentive for our movement. And that is, um, that is the vitality and, <laughs> and you know, relevancy of our movement. Um, so if that is important <laughs> to, to an ordained person, then I, it, it's my opinion 
and my experience that that you really have to have more voices at the table. You really have to embrace shared leadership. Um, and and no one person is the should be the final final authority on how church is done, on how religious expression is carried out in our larger world. Um, that has to be collaborative. If we're a faith movement, that's not just a collection of authority figures. And I know that um, when we are in formation, not Beyonce formation, but you know, <laughs> ministerial formation, maybe a little Beyonce formation in there too. <laughs> when we're in formation, so many of us um, come from this notion of, okay, well, authority equals bad, you know, authority equals oppressive. And so it's kind of drilled into us, step into your ministerial authority, take up your ministerial authority, blah, 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 blah. Be authoritative. And um, that's never quite been a problem for me. <laughs> so, <laughs> I've always been kind of outspoken. And, um, <laughs> and so, but I get how people need that drilled into them to have more confidence to, to be a leader. Um, a lot of, a lot of folks who step into ministry don't have that in the, naturally in their personalities. However, it, it's kind of, we kind of swing that pendulum a little too far and uh, often. And then we see what Aisha's um, speaking to is um, this, well, you do your thing. And often for religious educators, that's babysitting. <laughs> um, you know, it's and, and religious education and, and church music and all the worship arts, all the social justice endeavors aren't given the same kind of status as what's seen as under the, the ordained minister's purview um, within congregational life and within our movement at large. So, um, yeah. I'll just say you answered that with a deftness of a politician. <laughs> I mean, well done, you know, well done. So, and you work for the UUA and I used to, but I don't anymore. So I'll respond. And this isn't about the UUA, it's about our larger systems. But Aisha, I think what you're lifting up is as long as it's optional for the people in power to share power, it's not really going to happen. And so, you know, like right now, you know, it is optional. It's completely optional. And I'm aware of three ministers right now who have actually lost their positions because the staff rose up and said they were so horribly treated by them. And so I feel like um, there is a shift going on, but until that becomes a cautionary tale that other, and I'm sharing that so that other ministers who treat their staff badly will go, what? I could lose my job for it? Because until that happens, until there's a power shift, you know, in the way that we Reward and that's what has to happen. Yeah, it has to happen. That's what has to happen. It has to be a, a, a larger cultural shift. And I'm really hoping that the work that Asia and Deanna are doing in conjunction with the Faith Development Office really helps to push that conversation forward um, and that more people do come on board with this notion. And, you know, rightfully so, if people are losing their job because they're not that, that, you know, they're being too heavy handed or abusing. I will use the word abuse because there that does happen. These really con contemptuous um, relationships that I hear about so often with religious educators working with um, these heavy handed and, and authoritative ministers. Um, often that's the case. I mean, sometimes I guess it could go either way, but but the the final say often does land with the, the minister. So um, it has to be who a often, cultural shift. Right, who often in our structure is the only person in touch with the board formally. I mean, so these yes. are st structural issues I just want to raise. And Alita yes. Shuffler asked on Facebook, don't you use have other offices besides ordained ministers? Sure, we do. But ordained ministers kind of are setting all the policies in a lot of ways. And so... Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, there are lots of other religious professionals and lay leaders who don't aren't accorded the same um, structural uh, location. Re respect, actually, 
it, I feel like it comes down to respect and um, not just for folks as a person, but for the expertise that people bring to their positions. Um, the years of experience, the oftentimes um, academic backgrounds that people have. I mean, people are coming into religious education, not all, but, but many with social work backgrounds, with education backgrounds, with, you know, child development, psych psychology backgrounds, years of working with, with kids and adults, um, teaching, um, planning, event plan, you know, so, so much in the toolkit. And it's um, so often religious education is thought of A, as just about children and just, I mean, don't get me started on how we should respect our kids and understand them, not as the future, but the present as well of our multi-generational movement. But, um, but religious education is multi-generational and, um, and, and it's, then religious educators are are devalued as being, you know, let's who we delegate the the children that we kind of want to see definitely don't want to hear to. So um, all so much needs to change. Yeah, there are so so many layers to this that um, we could spend we could spend weeks uh, <laughs> talking about on the view and not just. In Thursdays, weeks, um, you know, and I and I think that, you know, you say uh, the incentive right now is because it's how we do religion well, um, which is incentive for some of us certainly. Um, I also think it's how we do life well. Um, that those of us with power um, use that power well. And, and use that power in collaborative ways. I mean, it, it's, I think it's how we have to approach life. Um, you know, I, uh, so, the, so the, the layer that, that we haven't talked about is sort of the, is the historical, uh, the historical sexism layer of this too, that, you know, for many, many years in, in our congregations, the minister was a man and the religious educator was his wife. Who worked for free, right? Um, and uh, at this point in 2018, a majority of our ministers are not male anymore, um, but a majority of our religious educators still are women. Um, and there's there is a layer of of gendered uh, power that that gets laid upon you know who who we want to hear from and who we give authority to. That I think it's worth. <laughs> <laughs> worth saying explicitly too. Well, even even with women ministers, uh, authority is gendered as masculine, and the ways that it's it's um, embodied is often masculine. And um, even even in the way, I mean, some people ha just have that that aesthetic where they have. You know, we certainly have Meg with the shorter hair on the call, but you know, a lot of people do, and I was one of them, cut their hair short to be taken seriously. Now this is as the a lesbian look. All right, this is the, the lesbian hair. I'm a lesbian as well, Meg. <laughs> so <laughs> this is the old lesbian haircut. <laughs> I mean, I'm I'm not that young, but um, <laughs> but. You know, I I know that there's a lot of discussion online in forums that I'm a part of about um, femininity in ministry and how that's expressed, and that goes for leadership style as well, um, and and level of collaboration versus authority. Um, how can authority be feminine? <laughs> you know, how can feminine attributes and non Eurocentric uh, characteristics such as um, multiple voices in leadership, not just the one at the top, how can those be integrated into what we understand as ministerial authority and ways to garner respect and trust from the congregation who are looking, rightly, rightfully so, to the minister to guide them. So th these are all things that, that float around in, in my mind and 
thankfully are happening online and in certain places as well. I was and, thinking, oh, sorry, Chris. Sorry. Um, so I was, what I was going to say is that um, just also lifting up that that feminine and masculine is on a spectrum, like of how, who identifies with those quote unquote, you know, typical feminine masculine traits. Um, we're now even learning more broadly, you know, as we come into um, understanding of non-binary and um, gender fluid folks that, you know, even those definitions of what we consider to be masculine or what we consider to be feminine, um, how those also hold us back from embracing the fullness of who we are. Um, so Meg, I'm gonna let you get your, your question in and then exactly. um, try and, and definitely turn us to, uh, to drum in the, in the Global Majorities Collective. Well, this could be a pivot. It, I was realizing this is, you know, somebody had a meme, uh, you, you proverb, not really a question, more of a statement, you know, but um, I was thinking earlier, Madi, when you were talking that what you were describing of all that connecting that you want to do and all that networking, I heard somebody years ago from Nigeria say, in Nigeria, a spokesperson is a person who serves the spokes of the wheel, not the person who stands on top and speaks for and it's a really different way of understanding power and authority to be that kind of spokesperson versus the up on the pedestal type of spokesperson. So I, I'd been thinking about that as you were describing your vision for leadership, that that is in a way a really non-Western but really powerful way to lead of, of holding all of those connections. Um, so anyway, so that's kind of a transition to the global majorities. Yeah. I. Um... Another one of my um, famous soapboxes is <laughs> famous to people who have to are subject to hearing them from me all the time. <laughs> but um, <laughs> uh, is that I believe that we have a, an invisible or silent C at the end of UUA. And we should, I think, call ourselves the UUAC and that the C stands for con of congregations. And we don't understand ourselves as spokes of the whole. And I love that image of a wheel with spokes because, uh, you know, oftentimes we hear, well, Boston said, well, UUA has told us that da da da. And it's like this whole, you know, you use love being, they, we love underdog stories and we love being the underdog in the story. <laughs> and if we're not, we'll create a story so that, you know, we'll create our own oppressions. And, um, and so we, I, I really hope that not just congregations, but UU communities and organizations, professional organizations, affinity groups such as DRUM, understand ourselves as a, an association and that we willingly associate and there are really wonderful benefits to being a part of that willing, you know, um, intentional community of, of this faith movement. Um, so to talk about affinity groups, drum in particular, <laughs> um, I, I really think that my work with, with drum, the year, well, the year of my hire um, was what got me the job. I don't know. I haven't asked Jessica explicitly, but um, but I know that um, that that I was asked a lot of questions about the Global Majorities Collective, um, my kind of brainchild, um, and that that work that I was getting off the ground with Drum at the time of my hire. Um, so should I speak to kind of its inception? Yeah, I think if I think you know if you can just say a little bit about Drum and, and what it is, yeah, yeah, what it what its role is within Unitarian Universalism, but then yeah, just kind of how the Global Majorities you know idea came came to be, and then how mm -hmm. it came into being. Sure. So Drum has been around um, for over twenty years now. And we are a people of color organization. We used to be a, an affiliate group of the UUA. Um, that meant um, that, that we were um, 
in an indirect or tangential relationship to the UUA. We, they didn't, uh, like the, the, the UUA staff or, or board didn't govern um, our, our comings and goings, our activities, but we were grant, we were in an accountable relationship and, um, and we were given a, an annual budget. Um, so that doesn't happen anymore. Um, uh, and that's been really difficult on drum, but drum formed, um, drum formed, um, as I understand it, as um, it was first uh, an, a group of black ministers who decided to affiliate and um, have uh, an affinity group that talked about their experience. Then it opened up through conversation, it, it very soon opened up to um, ministers of color. Then the um, ministers of color and formation wanted to have that guidance and uh, mentor kind of relationships and be in on those conversations and in that space. So um, it just kept, the circle kept widening. And, um, and I think that folks at first were bringing their, occasionally bringing their white spouses. And um, it got to the point where uh, Drum then said, um, no, actually we, we need our own space as people of color, even though you, you may be woke or down, you know, uh, we need our own space. So then um, allies for racial equity, um, and that's, there's way more to that history as well, but we'll focus on drum. <laughs> um, allies for racial equity formed in part to um, give white allies uh, a space to, um, to gather, um, so that there's, we're, we're having fewer folks knock on our door and, and want to be um, privy to conversations that should be held between people of color for folks to feel like they're not taking care of white emotions and often white tears. So um, that's a little bit about how it formed. And I've been in leadership for um, on and off for uh, over 10 years now, I think. Yeah, um, I started out in drum youth and young adult uh, division, which was known as drum yaya. Um, it dissolved shortly after the dissolution of uh, YRUU national convening and um, our um, the divestment of um, the board in um, in drum. Um, so without without the, the structure of the YRUU national convening, it was harder to find youth and young adults to, um, to grab them together and of color. I mean, and um, in the divestment, we just couldn't afford um, the same level of, of programming. Um, but we're, we're crawling back. Um, we're, we have some dedicated volunteers. We're all volunteer run. Um, we would love to have at some point uh, the funds to employ a part-time administrator to help us keep up. So many of us are religious professionals um, and parents of small children and all, you know, we have lives. And so the, our volunteer gigs and leadership of drum, um, you know, suffer um, for that. But, um, but yeah, we're kind of this, this scrappy bunch of folks who, know the importance of UUPOC community and love that extended family so much that um, through all the um, twists and turns and highs and lows, we've managed to, um, to stay afloat. And through the Global Majorities Collective, we're really hoping to um, not only thrive, but have major contributions to the larger UUPOC community. So what was the impetus behind the Global Majority Collective of, of like how did how did you start thinking about that? So like so much of um, <laughs> like so many good ideas and um, organizing that's happened within drum over the years, especially with drum yaya. Um, and most recently, <laughs> drum in general. Um, I have to hand it to Joseph Santos Lyons. Um, 
I was visiting him in Portland after attending the um, ordination um, at a nearby congregation of Reverend Teresa Soto. And um, so I was hanging out with Joseph and he is such an organizer to the bone, even though we're great friends and have been for years. Um, I feel like he he almost can't <laughs> just just kind of shoot the breeze in a normal way. He's always so passionate about organizing and the thing, the, his various ministries that he's involved in. So we're driving around and he asks me, so what is your larger vision for drum in the future? <laughs> and at the time I was president elect of drum. I stepped back from that position when I took the role at the UUA. Um, under, you know, I sought the advice of drum elders, including our three, um, at the time, our three co-presidents, you know, and I do believe that folks who advised me to step back had both um, the interests of drum and my own in interests at heart when they said, no, it, you don't want to do both. So I stepped back from, from that role of president. Um, and just stuck stuck with the global majorities um, coordinating piece, but um, but yeah. So so he's asking me what my larger vision is, and I'm completely not thinking about that at the time. But um, I'm thinking okay, I gotta come up with an answer, and, and let's have this conversation. So um, so I start just kind of going. It was a rant. I'll I'll admit that it was a rant about. Um, the how how saturated our movement is with um with eurocentric culture and white supremacy and how e that even shows up in poc spaces because we are so as as individuals uh, um are so saturated with those messages um from birth and definitely as as members of this faith that's so very white and white centric. Um, so I was going off on that and he keeps asking me as he does so well, okay, so then what would, what would it look like if it were to change and how would that happen? And da, da, da. so by the end of the night, he goes to bed and I was staying in his guest room and, and I stayed up making notes and, you know, I, cause I said, we, what we really need is, is we need cultural change. We need our own unique culture. How come the Baptists and the, you know, da, 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 da Catholics and, you know, you name it get to have unique expressions that uh, that are not white. They, there are Korean Presbyterian churches. <laughs> there are Black Baptist churches. And you'll walk into a white version of the same denomination and have a completely different cultural experience, even if the theology is, is very close in nature. So, you know, it's from how you're greeted at the door to what's happening before and after church, to the music that's sung, the way people move or don't move. And we just, the way prayers are spoken or not, um, we don't have that yet <laughs> as you, you people of color. You know, um, we have glimpses of it in POC, you, you POC space, but we don't have our own unique POC multicultural religiosity, expression of Unitarian Universalism. So I sat and thought and talked to different people and wondered, well, how can we co-create it? And culture is not a thing that just is born <laughs> or forced even, but we're trying to do both. <laughs> uh, you know, culture is something that is passed down over generation over centuries even um, it's it's created by by folks within the culture but also with outside influence and you know it, it encompasses all the senses um, you know there's food and there's music and there's literature and there's academic discourse and there's um, music I mean just everything and when you add in um, a, a culture of religiosity, then that is also shaped by collective and individual theologies. It's shaped by former religious experience. It's shaped by individual um, 
experience of the divine, collective experience of the divine, blah, 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 blah. I mean, it, it, it's such a big thing, culture. Um, so the Global Majorities Collective, it's, um, th there's an application process. And um, after this episode, I understand that the link for um, this year's application will be in, um, included um, in the information. And um, if you're a person of color who identifies as Unitarian Universalist, if you're a creative person who likes to um, generate and produce, um, who wants to be a part of the, the, the co-conception and birth of this, of this new um, culture, then um, please do throw your name in that hat. We have um, several spots open for a new cohort to join last year's cohort. Um, what we do is we come together with just a bunch of ideas floating in our heads and together over a weekend, we, um, we form a think tank, a big brainstorming session. We have a ton of worship. We have a ton of community building time built in because we are intentionally countercultural. It's not just work, work, work. It's, um, it's singing and moving and laughing and eating and all the stuff. Um, and we together come up with ideas and form groups or some people choose to work on a project individually, but by the end of the weekend, um, you know, very rough draft pro project proposals are, um, are submitted and um, people present what their ideas are to one another. Um, some are, are putting together hymnals. Most of these are gonna be uh, multi-year projects. Um, we're hoping that people cross-pollinate, that poets work with musicians and academics work with, you know, someone who wants to write a cookbook. I don't know, <laughs> you know, <laughs> just um, visual artists are working with historians. And um, so we're really hoping that, that folks come together in interesting ways. And this is, um, we're creating resources and pieces, little nuggets of culture that we hope to give as gifts to the larger UUPOC community. Um, it's for the use of, um, of the entire UUPOC community. It's, it's uh, culture, resources, information for uh, music, what food, whatever, uh, for us, by us. Sometimes I say UU. Boo boo you 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 know and uh, and we're sure that like any POC cultural expression, hands down that is um, that becomes um, popular um, among POC, it will be co-opted at some point by white you use, but that and and shape shifted and all this stuff. Um, but that is not the um, the target. Um, community that we're hoping this benefits. If we're not um, necessarily going to um, put it out there where it's accessible and readily, you know, so that white EUs can just take it up. But when that happens, it happens, but yeah. Madi, what is the, I guess the part that I'm unclear on is what is the relationship between the Global Majorities Collective and DRUM? Is it two separate entities? Did Mari freeze or is that just my computer? Mari is frozen on mine too. So I will answer <laughs> as I understand it while we're seeing if Mari can uh, come back. And um, as I understand it, the Global Majority Collective is a part, is a project of DRUM. Um, so that's the connection between the two that they are holding the um, kind of the organizational um, part of the Global Majorities Collective um, under, under the drum umbrella. So the idea being that the Global Majorities Collective is producing materials, um, like she said, for us, by us, for um, intentionally, that was the thinking behind, although not part of the Global Majorities Collective, of the book Centering, is right. that um, Reverend Mitra Aranama had envisioned a book for many years 
written by religious professionals of color for religious professionals of color. So uh, it sounds like the same thing. But yeah. while we're waiting, should we answer Yuri's question? It's a yes. little bit off a different topic, but go ahead. You want to <laughs> take that? So Yuri Yamamoto um, was in the chat box earlier when our, we were having our conversation about um, uh, shared ministry is, and her question is, is the collaborative ministry part of the formal UU ministry, UU ministerial formation? Um, and to my knowledge, I don't think that there's a shared ministry um, portion. I think, I think it's random. That. I think some, yeah. some internships would model that and some right. internships would model something very different from that, but it's random. Yay, she's back. Yay, Hello. everybody's back. <laughs> Mike. <laughs> I'm on my cell now because my computer <laughs> completely froze. So here I am. Sorry about that. Wait, Michael, Michael was saying something. I don't want to lose. And, and it's also, you know, depending on what classes you take with who. Uh, it's not so that the, if the question is, is it part of the formal UU ministerial formation? The answer is no. Right. <laughs> so UU ministers are not expected to have competence in collaborative leadership in order to become ministers, right? They're, they're and that's a problem. Have, we're, that's we're expected, a problem. Yeah, we're expected to have competence in a, a male Eurocentric model of authority as, as it was named earlier. That's what we're expected to have competence in, right? And, and if we can't say that that's a problem, then something is wrong, right? But I think that that's part of also what uh, the board and the MFC are trying to change uh, in um, in in revisioning, you know what what our our ministerial fellowship committee guides ministers to. Yeah. yeah. So and Jessica, and Jessica, yeah, I was just gonna say Jessica noted that um, when she was at Meadville, um, that she experienced some working hard to speak to that mission of shared ministry, which is fantastic to hear, and um, and still is you know, as I think Isha and, and Mari and Michael and, and Meg have said, is if it's not formally expected, then it's optional. And so even if it's at our seminaries, then, you know, we, if we don't have everybody going to our seminaries um, as part of their ministerial formation, um, then, we, then we don't hit that and it's still that, that optional part. And so since Madi is back, <laughs> I want to get back to the Global Majorities Collective. And the question we answered, Madi, while you were gone was just the relationship of the collective to, to, um, to drum. And yes. that, you know, drum is kind of the, the umbrella um, keeper of the Global Majorities Collective. Um, yes. But one what of the questions that, that I had um, about the collective is, so we know um, you know, it's, it's in its first year and it's um, doing the things that in innovation we know happens, which is kind of, um, you know, sometimes it's, it's easier to, to get ideas off the ground. Sometimes you have really big ideas um, that become something different and then you have to kind of piece them together. Um, how has that felt for the, for the folks that are in there? Because it, it, can, it can be like, I mean, a little bit stressful when you're trying to create something new, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, something that we have discovered in this first year is that um, we can have really, really big ideas. And, um, and that's awesome and actually necessary for visioning. But, um, but then life happens. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so, um, and pressures and, and just, you know, other stresses and obligations. So um, many projects that we're hoping to be completed by um, this next gathering in August in El Paso um, is, you know, they, they've had to um, reimagine the, the projects as being um, multi-year, which I think is, is wonderful, A, because it forces us to stop and look at how we're still steeped in that Eurocentric perfectionism, deadline, 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 culture, mindset. Um, so while I, I am also subject to, ah, I didn't stay on top of this, I didn't get this done on time, I should have been better about this, I am really good at that. 
personally. Um, but while, while I'm subject to that, I'm also, um, as coordinator of this, conscious of the fact that we need to, to make ourselves get into the, the practice of countering that narrative and dangerous self-talk and, um, and group talk and shaming. And so, um, so yeah, a lot of these projects are still in the works. They're still, um, folks are still very passionate about them and, and, and they, they will get done in their time and maybe continue. We've got a, um, uh, a hymnal being, um, curated of new brand new hymns by and for UU musicians and poets of color. We've got um, workshop series. We've got uh, curricula. Um, all these things coming down the pipeline by folks who are absolutely passionate and skilled and talented. We've got visual art. We've got photography. Um, yeah. So Marty, one of the questions I had is, um, are the folks that are part of the, I know that there was a big fundraising push to get the Global Majorities Collective off the ground um, to be able to fund the gatherings of, of folks. Um, are folks also able to have the stipend um, in, order to, in order to do some of this work? Or, because often when, you know, when, we, when we talk about resourcing, right, it's, mm -hmm. it, it's an issue. And that is, particularly, that, particularly within Unitarian Universalism, um, and when we saw, you know, the defunding of DRUM and mm -hmm. the defunding of YRUU Continental Youth Continental yeah. events, we really saw what the result of that is. So I'm I'm just wondering. It was devastating to to both of those communities. Um, so we at this point do not have the means to to give folks stipends for their work. Um, it is volunteer labor of love, but we are wanting to um, at least, at the very least, have the resources to not ask a dime of folks to, to come to the gathering in August once they are um, brought into the collective, once they've applied. And, and um, we think that the, their skill set, we really try to make the group as, um, we, we think about like the ability to work together well, um, a good array of, of talent skill set, um, ideas people have when, when, um, when folks apply. So if folks applied last year and um, there wasn't a spot, we have very few, you know, because we're, we're paying for everyone to get there and stay there and, and all that. So um, try to reapply next, I mean, this year and next year, don't, don't give up there. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that we consider when um, when looking to accept members, new members into the collective. But um, we and, also want to. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say we also want to be able to fund the projects themselves in terms of what what do they need to get off the ground, even if we can't give a stipend to the folks. Maybe there's um, equipment or copyrights or whatever whatever we need to buy. Um, so actually. I'm glad for this question because we really could use um, donations to the project, um, desperately so. Um, we we uh, funded last year's and we're hoping to um, fully fund this year's gathering. Um, we would love it if, if congregations would consider splitting the plate or giving the plate some Sunday to the Global Majorities Collective or to drum in general. We would also really love it if folks who are to be um, installed or ordained soon um, would consider splitting or giving the plate to, um, to drum um, in general or the Global Majorities Collective in particular to help make, um, you know, um, this is not just about a, a project. I really see this as a way to, to ensure the survival of UUPOC community. We need to have our own expression. We need to feel like we're not just guests. We're so often made to feel like we're guests here. Um, and and I want to give a shout out to uh, to Blue because they were a huge um, fundraiser. Um, they actually did a, a really large donation last year. They that did. Was, 
um, that they offered up as a match. And that they really did. drove a lot of, uh, of funding to the project. It, they sure did. They sure did. And, you know, that's our family. And um, a lot of folks who are members of Blue are also members of DRUM. We have members of Blue in the Global Majorities Collective. This is not just, you know, for DRUM. This is um, for, you know, dues paying members of DRUM. This is for our larger UUPOC family. Um, even folks who have attended a UU church a couple of times, but don't feel comfortable enough to sign the book. And, um, but are looking for an inroad, you know, a door where they don't have to check their, um, so much of themselves at the door. So they don't have to do so much code switching. It's exhausting. It's exhausting yeah. for us as religious professionals. I, I always think about, you know, imagine the, the, you know, random visitor. Right. It's, it's gotta be, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I appreciate that. And I, I appreciate the, um, the working relationship between drum and blue and, and how, you know, blue has definitely brought um, a different way of thinking about resourcing um, uh, black you use and with that also POC you use. And I think drum has been um, at least as a member of drum, it's been really um, inspiring to me to watch the ways in which those two groups um, have interacted and, and really work to be a collaborative force. And, um, and so, you know, I think a lot of times folks um, in the past have, have tried to pit the two against each other. And, and to me, it's, I think that the ways in which we can show how this is um, collaborative and done in a loving way has been just really beautiful. And also own um, the ways in which anti-Blackness shows up in POC spaces and own that that is work for non-Black POC to do uh, as well. So Definitely. I'm Definitely. really, really excited about that. And, and I think clearly we need to get um, some folks from DRUM back. Um, I think we did a DRUM show a little while ago, but I, I'm, it would be great to yes. um, to get Ramla and um, oh my God I'm losing Sana Sana, Sana, Sana. Sana. thank yeah. you they're they're serving as interim co-presidents right currently. Um, so um, and find out more about that we are coming to the end of our show so I just wanted to say thank you so much for being here and um, next week we have uh, members of the commission on no is that next week that is. Um, no, no, sorry, that's we're, we're hoping to have uh, members of the, the UUA Presidential Search Committee on next right. week talk about and our most recent report uh, to the to the association. Yep. Which has some, some <laughs> it does. Uh, suggestions. And then the week after that, we will have um, some members of the Commission on Institutional Change. And then the week after that, we are looking at trying to bring you a live from General Assembly in Kansas City. So uh, yeah, I know we're all so excited to so stay tuned uh, for more information as to the uh, showtime and date for that. Uh, we're still trying to work that out. Thank you again, Muddy. Yeah, if you'd like more information on DRUM or the Global Majorities Collective, hit us up uh, on our website, drum.org. That's two U's, two M's and or our Facebook page, diverse it's spelled out, Diverse and Revolutionary UU Multicultural Ministries. You can send us a message, a message there. Yes, very long name. Thank you all for having me. It was a great time. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Maddie. Bye, everybody. Bye.